Really excited to be here with you guys. Uh, I want to cast your minds back, uh, if we could, just a few years, um, to a time before any of us were working full time on anything Ethereum related. Um, the other day, I was looking through my kind of past profile on Stack Exchange, and I found this question that I had asked. Um, about four years back. In fact, sometimes when I'm searching for a problem to some programming issue that I'm having, uh, you know you've been sort of like hacking for a long time when you find yourself asking the same question on Stack Overflow like five years earlier and you're like, and you've already forgotten how to do it again, right? Um, this is one of those related times. I found that I had asked this question it was sort of right around the time that Edward Snowden and all the, the revelations around what he, he had been doing and what he had learned were coming out. And um, all of this strong concern on the part of the developer community about uh, our tools and whether they're safe to use and whether we're promoting desirable or you know, undesirable ends with the tools that we build. And my question was, will we ever get to a point where the core protocols of the internet are robust and secure enough that surveillance and centralized control becomes effectively infeasible. And uh, I feel really excited to be actually working on these problems full time right now, and I'm sure many of you are as well. So um, it's just great to be here and be able to talk about those. But this road, this journey towards a more decentralized, more egalitarian structure for the internet is really hard, it's really difficult and it won't happen quickly or in, in one, you know, from one day to the next. So when a, when a company starts to build a decentralized app that they really want, they often are finding right now that they have to build three or four other startups before they can even build the startup that they wanted to build. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. So I first want to go through some of the features of this new decentralized future and what, what is required and compare them with where we're at right now. Um, if any of you were at the meetup last night, some of these topics were covered a little bit. And uh, Victor said, well, what was Web 1.0? A lot of people ask that. Well, what was Web 1.0 and why are we starting at 2 instead of, instead of 1? Well, um, Web 2 was characterized primarily by more user-generated content, right? So users were participating more and the systems that they had for participating were better to where they could share their opinions and not merely read content that was created by a few, but actually start to engage in some you know, back and forth discussions and things like that. Another f big feature of Web 2 was uh, focused on the user experience. So users were having um, a, a richer experience online where you didn't have to like wait five seconds after every click or everything that you typed to see some change in your interface. Um, but now we're talking about the transition from Web 2 to Web 3 and um, what the, some of the limitations of Web 2 are. And some of these we didn't even fully realize until things like the uh, Edward Snowden revelations came out and the people just freaked out and uh, I think set the NSA's work back by like decades already with uh, how much more people are concerned about that and are caring about it. So one example is in addressing. In um, the current protocols of the internet, uh, IP addresses are an essential piece of them. Um, and these addresses are geolocatable in almost all cases. So like if someone knows your IP address, in most cases they can actually pinpoint where in the neighborhood you are, not just in, the, in a city or somewhere, but even sort of what block or what general vicinity in the neighborhood you are. And you know, if, if they have a log somewhere that has your IP address on it, they can even contact your internet service provider and collect that information, say, you know, if they have the right authority, who was logged into your servers at this point in time, right? So it's really close. Another thing is that IPs can be blocked, right? Um, if someone really doesn't want someone else accessing the content on that IP, they can uh, shut it down or at least effectively make it so that all the people they care about can't see it by blocking their routing to it. Um, but in Web3, we need an addressing system where 
the geographic location of the address is not, not immediately known, not understood. And so we use peer-to-peer -peer networking layers or overlays on top of that um, underlying IP network to make it so that you know, the people you're communicating with or the servers you're interacting with, um, you really don't know and don't care where that information's coming from. Another important piece that is needed is name services. So um, with the current domain name system, uh, it's a hierarchical system. So each, there's a few organizations that are in charge of the, the root level domains and um, you, know, you work on down from there. And these organizations, get, they have control over who gets a certain domain. And um, furthermore, because it's hierarchical, each system can, um, each jurisdiction can decide like which domain names they want their, their uh, constituents to have access to and which ones they don't. And so they can use um, various things to block those. But now we have something like ENS or prior to that there was something called Namecoin with a similar concept. But this idea is that um, a decentralized system is used for tracking the record of what memorable name points to where. And of course we need these, this system because we don't think in numbers. We think in, in names and, and words for things. So we need a way of associating memorable names with, uh, with numbers. Another um, layer that is needed to be supported in a more decentralized fashion is the payment system. Um, this is probably the most you know, famous one, the most well-known uh, part of blockchain related technologies. But um, with cryptocurrencies, we now have the ability to exchange value from one party to another across jurisdictional boundaries um, in fairly real time. And uh, that's also very important for uh, other systems like incentivization, which we'll get to. Um, and another thing that's important with these new payment systems is the idea that theoretically anyway, they're more efficient. So they would allow us to charge lower fees for these payments which would enable us to um, make, use micropayments for things um, to incentivize very small behaviors that previously would have been so expensive to conduct a transaction with that they, they weren't worth doing anything about. Another important feature that needs to be migrated to this Web3 world is uh, communications and all the different ways that we, we are talking to each other. So right now, our communications tools are centralized, they're siloed, and because there's no inherent incentive for different operators to uh, build these tools and maintain them, they, the power tends to be consolidated in a few large players. Um, you know, by show of hands, how many here have a Gmail address that they use for their primary communication? Um, I'll admit it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and frankly, this is something we discovered at Mainframe as well, where prior to our recent pivot towards a fully decentralized product model, we were working with federated email-like systems. And what we discovered is that like, even though we built these open source tools that anyone could install and set up, hardly anybody did that. Um, most people don't want to maintain their own nodes, don't want to, there was no strong incentive for them to do so. And so the power ended up getting consolidated in these few silos. Um, by contrast, in Web3 land, uh, our communications need to not be just decentralized and peer-to-peer, -peer, but they also need to have additional attributes that we've become aware of are, that are important, like uh, surveillance resistance and censorship resistance. So, um, uh, and that reminds me, I was going to start something here. Forgot to start my recording. Um, so. In here we have this example of a network where uh, you, you have a packet that's flowing from one side of the network to the other, but the packet has only been partially addressed. So this packet is, um, it travels efficiently along the route that it's following until it reaches all the nodes whose addresses match. And then within that zone, it, it essentially behaves as a broadcast. It gets broadcast to, towards all of those nodes and only the one with the private key is able to decrypt that message. And we'll get into more detail about that particular system. But this is an example of 
a surveillance resistant and censorship resistant system because within this zone, uh, it's very difficult for even powerful actors to determine which node is talking to what other node. So uh, the, these qualities are important because um, it's not, um, censorship and surveillance aren't just about knowing what's being said. You, you may have the perfect ability to mask your communications uh, through encryption, but just knowing that two people are talking to each other may be enough for them to get in trouble in certain cases. Um, or, in some cases, merely stopping people from being able to communicate is also a problem, which is, is the censorship problem, right? Another important service that's needed for um, us to have fully decentralized applications is file storage. And right now, our tools are things like Amazon S3, Dropbox, um, Google Cloud. Uh, these tools are centralized, they're managed. In a peer-to-peer -peer file storage system, you need the same kind of redundancy, the same kind of security, and the same kind of reliability that these other tools have, uh, but without anybody in, in control. So um, in this example here, we have fragments of a file that are being spread around uh, a peer-to-peer -peer network, and each node is incentivized to store those things and must provide some kind of proof that it's storing those things cryptographically. Um, but just being able to store large blobs of data is not enough because our applications need to be able to rapidly retrieve small bits of information and update small bits of information. And so that's why we have databases, right? So any fully decentralized Web3 system is going to need to have data services of some kind. And what we see here on the right is an example of a, an application that's been um, for managing a person's mailbox that's been built on top of a decentralized database. And so you have this little um, you know, diagram showing that like below that conceptual virtual database is a bunch of, of nodes that are actually storing the data. Um, and one other thing that you really need that hasn't been maybe discussed or mentioned as much is that um, when your devices are all offline, you sometimes still want to be notified about certain things. You, you want certain things to happen when none of your clients are, are online. And in, in, in general, in decentralized applications, your client ends up being a lot heavier. Your client is doing more work. It's, um, you're, you're trusting less in some sort of service type infrastructure, some server out there doing the work for you, and so that you rely more heavily on the client. But clients are sometimes disconnected, sometimes they, you know, you're on a mobile device that goes out of coverage, um, and you still want your applications in many cases to be able to perform periodic jobs and other things like that um, to keep things functioning. Let's say, for example, I have a budgeting app and I want it to warn me when I'm approaching my dining out budget for limit for the month. Um, and, and that needs to happen even when I'm totally offline. So we have some tools for that in Web2 um, that are processing large amounts of data and doing something with it. Um, but in this Web3 space, it's actually a really hard problem. Um, you have jobs that are being executed by independent peers. And one of the biggest challenges that we're running into right now as we just begin to wrap our brains around this space is like how to secure that data and how to trust the nodes that you're asking to, to run these periodic jobs or how to create a system in which you don't need to trust these nodes so that they can execute the data um, in a way that still maintains the, the user sovereignty on that data. And that, that's a really difficult challenge because it's really difficult to do a lot of computation on data that's not um, unencrypted. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a really cutting edge uh, problem right now. Um, so in addition to all of these different service layers, there's this important component of incentivization. So like I was saying, um, people need some reason to run this infrastructure uh, and support it beyond just the, the use of it. Um, the use of it is nice and some people are willing, in the case of email, for example, to host, to run their own email servers. But as we just saw, even 
from a very technical crowd here, the majority were not willing to run their own email servers. So we need some greater incentives. And, uh, and, and so we develop incentivization systems for that. And I wanted to talk about this crypto systems manifesto that was uh, written by Mike Golden that I think is kind of an insightful way of, of um, describing uh, incentivization systems. So he says that um, token-based incentivization systems have a few components or elements. They, they must work as a, a token must work as a necessary element of a self-sustaining system, which is a public utility. And he describes what each of those bolded elements is. So a token's necessary if anything else would damage the system's functioning. Um, so it's sometimes difficult to understand what this even means, but all you have to do is think about systems that don't currently have these incentives. So like uh, with email, um, when there isn't a token in place, the damage that occurs to the system is that you now have centralized control of that system. The, the, there are not that strong of incentives to run it unless you have ulterior motives for doing so. Um, the next point he makes is that um, for a system to be self-sustaining, it means that it would have to keep functioning normally even if its creators completely abandon the system. This is probably one of the points that I think is most fascinating to think about. Um, so there are tools we use every day in getting our work done that we really love and wouldn't want to do without. So, um, but how many here have come to use a software as a service product of some kind and that product has later been either canceled or discontinued or acquired by Google and suddenly they mothball the project, right? And you're like, oh, crap, how am I going to get my work done now, right? Well, in a truly decentralized application, um, that wouldn't be a problem because the app, as you've been using it, would continue to function indefinitely as long as you wanted to, you wanted it to because it's properly incentivized, and if the developers walk away, you at least can still use the, the app as it was, because the developers don't run or manage any of the infrastructure that the app relies on. Um, so finally, a system is only a public utility if it's permissionless, meaning anybody can join it, anybody can participate in this system. Um, and that's, uh, so, so some systems may not quite reach this level where the level of decentralization they have may not you know, allow that level of participation. Another thing that um, is really important to point out here is that these incentivization systems are very difficult to uh, plan effectively. So Trent McConaughey um, is talking about this and, and the interesting aspects of these systems. He says, you can design incentives of your choosing by giving them block rewards. Put another way, you can get people to do stuff by rewarding them with tokens. Blockchains are incentive machines. I see this as a superpower. The block rewards function defines what you want network participants to do. Then the question is, what do you want people in your network to do? It has a crucial corollary. How well can you communicate that intent to the machines? This is a devilish detail. Do we really know how to design incentives? And this article recently from Ilad Verbin um, gets into even more of this. And I think this is a fascinating article that I would definitely recommend that people look at. Um, but he, you know, he, he goes through several incentivization systems and points out that like Bitcoin, one of the successful ones, is actually one of the simplest ones as well. And that we're starting to build all sorts of new incentivization systems that are much more complicated and rely to a much greater extent on human interaction. And part of our assumption is that humans interact rationally, but that's not always the case. And that assumption may, uh, may in certain important cases, you know, fail. And um, furthermore, that like, if you're relying on humans to do things rather than being able to code computers to do these things, that it's a lot harder to predict how these systems might fail and under what conditions. So we could get these incentivization systems that are really well developed, um, have been operating for several years, and then we start to see cracks in the infrastructure and problems that emerge only under certain conditions, right? Maybe when the price isn't doing as well or, or whatever. So there's really challenging systems that we're 
um, only beginning to problems that we're only beginning to discover. So um, my migrating migrating all of these disparate services that I've discussed to decentralized alternatives is really challenging. And as I was saying, like any startup that wants to do something like this finds that it has several other problems to solve before it can. So at Mainframe, what we wanted to do was build a platform that would make that a little easier. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. So we feel that we can add a lot of value by being the glue above various projects, each of which is only providing a few of the pieces of this larger puzzle. So um, our platform, it will be an open source SDK built on top of various decentralized service layers. And the idea is that this platform will unify all of these uh, features under a solid, well-documented API that's a delight to use. Um, and these service layers will be incentivized with a common medium of exchange, so a mainframe token that um, is convenient for developers and users to just use as they're interacting with the system um, and not worry about the other tokens that may be involved in other service layers below. Um, some pieces of our platform will even be implemented on the platform itself. So uh, one of the first dApps that we'll be building on this platform is a token curated marketplace where developers can deploy their applications, sell them to other people, offer them for free, and um, the, you know, the users can rate the things that they like, the things that they don't, and um, essentially incentivize that, that the best apps rise to the top and also create a very easy system for uh, developers to use to deploy their applications. Um, we support and we contribute to various projects that uh, share our common goal of making decentralized apps easier to build, including Swarm. So we want to help these projects get across the finish, finish line faster. And um, so we're devoting our own engineering resources to several of these projects. Um, most notably Swarm, and um, because we realize that it's not always clear like which project is furthest ahead and which one is going to sort of win out. In some cases, there's been discussions about consolidation of effort between projects like IPFS and Swarm and other things. Um, we're not trying to like play favorites. Essentially, what we want to do instead is make the the service layers below our SDK sort of pluggable and configurable. So if you really like a certain flavor of, of storage or um, you know, data, database, um, our, our, our approach is going to be to sort of focus on the most popular ones first and allow you to configure your system as a developer or as an end user to uh, use the, the project that you prefer. And finally, in some of these systems, um, they have tokens of their own. So some of these systems allow us to just sort of plug our token into them and allow a configurable option of which token gets used for their incentivization layer. Our token right now is just an ERC-20 token. Um, in those cases, we can just kind of use that system as it stands, but in other cases, uh, like say IPFS, for example, they have Filecoin, they might not be interested in making a pluggable version of IPFS. Um, we might find that it's more of a pain to do that than it is to use something called an atomic swap, which would be that a certain pool of our tokens remains in reserve as a form of exchange between a pool of their tokens so that when a developer uh, buys uh, mainframe tokens, to, in order to do their work or a user, um, those tokens get pulled out of circulation in one place and placed into circulation in the other, the other uh, token space. And essentially, there is no inflation or deflation that's happening in either of those token spaces. That's called an atomic swap. Um, so uh, it kind of depends on the project as to what they're willing to support there. Um, another thing that we see that we need are apps to kind of drive our, the development of our platform and also to help us to like debug it, to see where there's problems, to showcase what can be done on the platform. So we're calling these reference dApps, and one of them is Onyx, which uh, was something that we kind of demonstrated at DevCon in November. 
and we're also playing around with here at the conference today. Uh, and there will be other reference dApps. We kind of, we have some of the funds that we've raised dedicated to the development of dApps in this space. And so we're supporting dApps that other people are building and um, trying to identify like what would be cool apps. Onyx is um, something we've noticed that right now in the blockchain community, there's like no, no quite de facto standard for like group messaging in a secure setting that's blockchain friendly. And so we think that that might be a cool app that a lot of people in, in this space would enjoy. Right now everyone seems to be using Telegram and it's like not doing very well, um, especially in, in group settings where there's just like this pile on free for all. It's practically unusable. Um, so that's something we're looking at. And of course, good documentation is really important. Um, and we're really going to work on that, and I'll talk more. Um, so we're going to support all, all major desktop and mobile platforms. Um, in some of these platforms, they, there may be limitations on how much we can do. Uh, but in those platforms that, that limit what can be launched and released, we'll at least support a browser-like experience. Um, and we might, you know, in, in some cases where you have more freedom, like on a desktop environment, uh, it's totally possible to build a, a fully native application that just makes use of our, use of our SDK. Uh, the first language that we want to implement this SDK in is JavaScript, but we're also interested in other languages um, that are, and, and so tell us what your favorite is, tell us what you would like to see, we'd love to see that. Um, I mentioned this about reference dApps, and uh, really that's just kind of a re uh, repeat of what I was saying before. But what I really want to hit home on is that we just want this to be like, um, you may have heard of Stripe, which is a payments company that um, really won out in the space because they made things so easy for developers to integrate with that developers, whenever their manager would ask them what payment system we're going to use, developers would say, well, it would take two days if we did Stripe, and it would take two weeks if we did this other one. And the manager always says, Stripe. And so uh, developer, delighting developers ended up becoming the key to their success. And we feel that that's really the key to our success as well. If we can create just really solid systems that are a, a delight to use, where you're never wondering how to do things because things are well documented and you get the answers you want. Um, that's really what we're going for. And we see our customer as the developer primarily. Uh, so that includes uh, detailed, legible, searchable documents that people can contribute to, um, well-written reference dApps that people can use to see how to do things and to learn from and that drive the, the uh, platform itself. Also, um, active support in online communities where developers are gathering right now and also fostering local meetup groups. So th those are the areas that we're really working on. We have a roadmap, a kind of high-level roadmap of that the first release, which we expect will be you know, sometime this year, um, is going to include uh, all the, the essentials to get, get started, you know, your documentation, dev tools, deployment tools and functional service layers, but it may not include full incentivization. So, you know, it's arguable how much a system can be decentralized without incentivization, because as we were saying, uh, without incentivization, their systems aren't self-sustaining. Um, but we feel that it's important to get something out there quickly and to get people able to build w tools with these and then, um, make the SDK in a way that when incentivization and full de fully decentralized model becomes mature, the developer doesn't have to change anything. It's all still working the same way. It's functioning the same way um, as, as they had before. And we intend to make some very small, on that note, we want to make small point releases in between these larger releases. So, um, you know, we want something very raw to be in your hands as soon as possible. So, Long before Apollo is released, we're going to already be releasing small point increments um, where you can play around with things. Um, and then we have, later on, we have some incentivization. And then at the, at the end, the, the final milestone is a fully mature incentivized uh, system. We have a team of uh, over seven engineers now. Um, 
and we're growing. We've recently uh, had a, a wildly successful fundraising round, and we're really excited about the future and would love to work together with more of you. So uh, please get in touch with us if you're wanting to build this uh, brave new decentralized future. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Victor. Could you please elaborate your focus in particular relation to someone? Yeah. What do you see as the most exciting, the most potential? What would you like to see maybe in your dream as the most potential? Yeah, so um, right now we're De dedicating a couple of engineers to uh, work on the swap, swear, and swindle uh, incentivization systems, and we're really excited about that. Um, and it's funny that that just seems like the frontier right now, so that's where we put our resources, but all of those other things like file storage are also critical and maybe a little bit less glamorous or something, I don't know, um, but still important. So I think that uh, there's a good chance that we will do, do some work there as well. Um, so in terms of where we're putting our engineering resources, those are the, the areas right now, but in terms of what we'd like to see, um, we've, so, so a, a couple of features that we've talked about and that we've been asked about are things like um, for communications, we're, we're making use of PSS and we're building some other protocols on top of PSS. Um, but we've been asked things that are a little more elaborate, like can you do streaming video or streaming audio? And I know that LivePeer is working on some stuff there, so I'm excited to see what they're doing. Um, we've been wanting to do some performance metrics just to see how practical it would be to do um, some of these more uh, high performance kinds of protocols in the comms layer, um, and, and maybe maybe the performance is sufficient. Is this in the context of Onyx being more like Skype for us? Potentially, yeah. Like um, someone might want to implement a real time video audio system over over uh, our platform, right? And there already is one other sort of. Uh, startup that came on the scenes that was comparing themselves to us and saying, oh, well, we do audio and video streaming as well. And we, we just, I mean, it's not like we couldn't do that, but we just hadn't really elaborated on that. So um, one of the things we thought of is that in certain circumstances, it might be acceptable, depending on your assurance level, to drop down to lower level UDP type communications in certain se settings. So like you'd have a handshake that might occur at the uh, PSS level in a more secure setting, but then once you've established the handshake, then you exchange uh, more you know, low-level information and you're willing to accept a degradation in your security level, right? Um, so that's just an example of something that we've been asked about. Um, I, you know, I think one area that would be interesting to me as well in Swarm is, um, the, the, the computing services layer. So I know that there are other projects that have been talking about it, but this seems to be entirely out, off of Swarm's radar. So if Swarm is wanting to um, like really dominate in this space, it seems like maybe they might want to look for a solution there as well to add to the, to add to the library of, <laughs> of tools that are available, right? Yeah, any other questions there? So the question with Onyx, I tried to follow the guide you put up, but I didn't want it to register for, register for AWS. And there was no guide to install it locally. So I went to the releases page on GitHub uh -huh. and then the client, which had a, an option to run the, the entire theme or whatever locally. And, and we actually tried it out and we could uh, send messages between each other. But I found no way to join the Swarm channel or I'm not sure. There was only an option to create channels. Yeah, so um, the Onyx server, which is that sort of mailbox service that you probably were talking about there, um, it is designed to be running alongside a Swarm instance. And it even has scripts in it in that project for starting up the Swarm instance. 
Um, but the branch that we're running against uh, for this particular client that we distributed just for the purposes of our kind of summit, this uh, is a different branch. Um, I'm not sure if the things you were running into were related to that or something else, but uh, it is true. I probably should have told you guys that AWS requires a credit card when um, <laughs> you sign up, even though they don't charge it if you just stay on the free tier. Um, so some people who didn't want to go through that, you know, may have a, a slightly longer setup. Uh, but we didn't really optimize for that scenario because we were just like racing to get something ready for the summit and we figured most people would want something that was more turnkey, like kind of a one click or five or six clicks as the case may be, install, you know, so. Um, but, but we have some time to hack on that and so maybe we could uh, take a look at what you're doing there and help get you through whatever, whatever challenge you're having. I think very general to, to try to get this ready and have some, have some fun using our technology. I know, I know it's, it's, it's better than it's better. Nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the. So please, please make it, guys, if you could help us, like, if you bump into it, ask for that. Yeah, we would love to. We'd love to get as many people on the system as we can. It's fun to kind of put it through its paces, so. Thanks a lot. I think I'm probably out of time at this point, so I'm just going to um, end, but feel free to ask me questions anytime throughout the, the summit. Thanks, guys.